can say from experience that there's, there's, you know, and you might have, have, have this same experience, that there, there's two common schools of thought about academic planning. You know, one is destination oriented. You know, you know or you figure out what your end goal is and you, you develop a plan for how to get there and you, you're diligent about staying on track and following the roadway to your destination. Uh, the second uh, approach is more exploration oriented. You've got an idea where you're headed, but you want to remain open or you, you sort of look for different opportunities and paths that emerge as you navigate your way. Um, sometimes these two approaches kind of follow from just where you are. Maybe you have a very clear goal um, and you want to get there. Um, or maybe you're really still figuring that out. It could relate to your personality, which, which of these approaches just sort of are more comfortable for you. And actually, it can also relate to the, the, the culture of the field or program that you are entering and what, what if it's a more structured or a more sort of free-flowing uh, sort of, of field. Now, there's benefits to having, finding and having a focus and being efficient in the way that you reach for your goal. But there's also benefits to not foreclosing too quickly on the possibilities and stretching yourself and trying some different things and allowing your goal to take shape over a period of time. So when you think about the MSI, I encourage you to take stock of your goals and where you're at with your goal orientation um, and kind of take stock of what is your preference for academic planning. Which of these approaches are you already pretty much already doing and which of them aren't you doing? Or are you doing both? Um, I would encourage you to seek a balance across the two approaches if you're too open and you explore too freely for too long, you, sometimes that can lead to difficulty with, with developing a, a coherent academic plan and, and being well prepared for specific career paths. But if you're too rigid with your plan, you may not realize that your interests have actually shifted or you may miss opportunities that would actually bring you uh, some real benefits for, for your overall goal. And I say this all because the, the structure of the MSI, of the, of the degree itself, is really well suited for this more balanced approach. This degree has a number of elements that provide some structure, and uh, yet it also has a lot of options and points of flexibility. For some of you, especially if you come from a, 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 a type of undergraduate program where you were pretty much given the list of courses you were going to take and you just ticked right through them, um, some of those points of flexibility may feel a little weird or just, you know, gosh, you know, there's so many options. Uh, for others of you that may feel really comfortable, but you may feel almost like certain parts of the degree, um, you know, like, why, why do I have to take this? <laughs> so I think it's about finding a balance. And the, the nice thing about our degree is that, is that it really kind of affords uh, some, some components of both. And I think that uh, just highlighting a few of those, those components might help you Almost think about what questions do you have as you go through the rest of the couple of days that you're here. Um, you probably know that we have some foundational courses and you know we teach a course called information in, in um, social systems and that is truly sort of that that course that tries to get at what are the core elements that every information professional needs to know or be, you know what are the, the con what are the underpinning concepts issues theories that are a part of this very diversified field. Uh, the Contextual Inquiry and Project Management course is again a very hands-on course. It's where you work in a diversified team with a client um, and you, you actually look to do some user-oriented, user-based um, analysis of needs and come up with actual recommendations for the organization. And then 502, if you come from a technical background, you will waive 502. If you don't come from as much of a technical background, this will give you a base of knowledge about how modern information systems are constructed. Um, now, when you applied, you had to select a specialization, and the specializations are an important part of the program. Uh, but they really, you, as, you, as you may have already started to see, they overlap quite a bit and maybe more than you might expect. The thing I would say is keep a healthy perspective on specialization um, and you know, we can have students who are in the same specialization but actually make their way through the program and take uh, pretty, you know, some varying courses, although there will certainly be some commonality as well. 
the practical engagement program we've been talking about a lot and that's again where we connect the classroom learning to real world situations a lot of that's through the credit-based internships but you know um, also even within the coursework within the the actual courses you're you're utilizing case studies client-based projects within courses other than the 501 course and using other hands-on learning approaches and elective so we don't have something you're not going to see something that just that says you know here's your elective requirement we don't, we don't have that but you know you're going to take 48 credits and and, and some, you know, basically, aside from anything that meets a requirement, you're going to have a little room in your program to think about what else do I want to take. And I guess what, what you'll find is that there's some interesting and strategic ways that you can map your program to make the most of the curriculum, and electives give you a little room to do that. Um, now, Cognate. At U of M, that basically means taking a course outside of the program you're enrolled in. And almost every degree program across the university at the graduate level has a cognate requirement. And what that means is that there's a culture of that. And so it's actually, it's not strange or um, really, really hard for you to get into a class in the business school or the policy school. And you may have at times some of those students in a class you're taking here at UMSI. So that helps again, you kind of, you can, you can, that's up to you. Some people, you know, choose a cognate because it's really a course they just, really are interested in and it doesn't directly relate to what they're doing others take that course and it it, it, it really just gives them a whole nother another dimension to the things they're already studying here um, so that's those are really the, the the main elements of the degree and and when we think about what you can study here this is where I can imagine it can get a little difficult if you're exploring because there's a lot to explore. Or if you're on a path, you might sometimes, during the course of your first term or first year, be exposed to some things and, and go, oh my gosh, I did not realize that there was this whole other thing. There's this, this, this area of um, you know, ubiquitous computing and there's actually there's a conference or there's a, there's a community and I didn't realize this was like a whole thing. And that happens. And then you're kind of, you can at times feel a little bit like, does this mean I'm changing? Am I changing my direction? That's why we have a lot of advising available. Maybe it doesn't, maybe it does. And we'll help you work through those times of helping you explore and figure out how your interests are, interests are evolving as you come through the program. And you notice on this list, I mean, network analytics, international development, collaboration technology, those aren't our specializations. That just shows that sort of the, the real range of things that happen at the school both through the curriculum and through faculty research, is really quite um, diversified. So these are the areas that we actually have as specializations. And you know, of course, you selected one of these when you applied. Um, the thing I would say again is that we encourage you not to define yourself or really your academic plan by your specialization alone. It doesn't mean it's not important. It doesn't mean it's not really the center point of why you came here. And that's totally fine. But, you know, I would just resist the temptation to, uh, when you introduce yourself, to say, you know, I'm Aaron and I'm HCI. Or, you know, I'm Joe and I'm LIS. Um, and, it, and it's okay if that happens. It does happen sometimes. And I kind of just go, well, I know there's a lot more to it beyond that. Because if you take five HCI students and talk to them, there's a whole rich array of what, what really they're doing, what they're interested in, where they're going. And the specializations um, are, are just one way of sort of organizing our curriculum. So the specialization typically is 12 to 15 credits towards your 48. You might choose more courses if you're really you know, focused. Uh, or you might kind of have a more diversified approach. Or you can actually do two of the specializations within the 48 credits. So the thing to that, that I would say also is that because you are completing this two-year robust master's program with 48 credits, you may want to have a couple of areas of strength. It gives you a little bit of flexibility and to be truly the most effective uh, UX designer or academic librarian, having knowledge of areas that dovetail or complement those fields is very wise and can actually make you even more marketable. Um, with the MSI, you really can have the best of both worlds. You can have uh, a career focus and some specialized coursework as, as uh, a, 
a center point of your degree, and you can build some complementary skills and knowledge that really set you apart. And briefly, I will just mention that um, you might have heard things like tailored, or we have dual degrees, master's thesis. I'll just say a few things about those now. Again, trying to whet your appetite, and you can talk to people more about these if they are something you want to learn more about. The tailored option, um, I would think of it as the self-designed major of the MSI. Uh, you already will have plenty of room for courses across the curriculum, as I've already described. But to shape your curriculum in a, in a particular direction, maybe from that one list I showed you that wasn't specializations, but you know had a lot of other areas, um, if you really want to try to shape your curriculum around one of those or something else, the Taylor program gives you that little added flexibility to work with a faculty member and really design a set of courses aside from those foundation requirements uh, that will that will best meet your goals. So. The job outcome can actually be fairly similar for someone who completes a tailored program versus someone who completes a specialization. So this is really as much an academic choice as it is a, 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 a way of, of somehow grandly changing your career outcome. Uh, but there can be some subtle or sometimes some important uh, benefits uh, to, to tailored. And we can talk to you more about that depending on your, your goals. Uh, dual degrees, uh, actually if you apply in your first year, or if you've already applied to another program or school at U of M, you can, uh, and you get admitted to both programs, you can complete two degrees in one year less time because both programs will allow some double counting. So that can be the MBA, the MSW, the public policy degree, uh, the law degree, even medicine and <laughs> nursing. And so, any two programs aside from those actually can be dual if you seek approval from both departments. Now again, you really might be able to achieve your career goals with one degree, although you can't really be a doctor unless you have the MD or, or a lawyer. But you know, a lot of the career goals that you want to have, you can, you, can, you can get with the one degree. So you want to evaluate this as an academic choice. What do I want to study? Do I want to become as knowledgeable about public policy as I do about information as far as my education and then to evaluate to what extent would having both of those degrees actually move me further, um, move me more specifically in an area that I want to go in. And we can help you with that. A few students a year propose a, a thesis. And if they get approval, if they find a faculty member willing to sponsor them and they get approved, then they can complete the program with a master's thesis. It's only an option that a handful of people do every time. Um, but what you do then is you do uh, two different independent studies in two different terms, three credits each, and that's the time you're spending working on your thesis. And when that's completed, you do, a, 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 you do an oral defense of it and it gets indicated on your transcript. Now doing a thesis is not a must for those who are considering doctoral study, but it can be beneficial to explore whether you want to do research at that level, um, or it can just be something that you just get passionately interested in, and it can actually really align with a career path as well, but it's something you want to do on a research level. So, I am just going to take a couple minutes um, to, to mention that, you know, a couple of ways that this can play out, okay? Um, let's talk about uh, a, a student, a real, just a real student. Um, so this student, uh, their actual specialization is uh, HCI, and their career goal is user experience designer or information architect. And, you know, in the first term, let's just assume, you know, they're taking the foundational courses, um, but they, they took the Fundamentals of Human Behavior course, Design of Complex Website, and we have a Drupal coding course. Um, in their second term, they took our Database Application Design course, uh, Needs Assessment and Evaluation of Systems and Services, and Interaction Design. Uh, this student then got selected for a Learning Analytics Fellowship. Uh, they did the alternative spring break and worked with the Inter-American Development Bank and they were a volunteer with the A2 Data Dive uh, 
the summer internship, was at GE, Advanced Manufacturing and Software Technology Center as an interaction design intern. And that first year pretty much aligns with, with a, a fairly, you know, straight up HCI oriented curriculum. The student comes back in the second year, they take Marketing 618 Survey Design. This covers their stats and Cognate. They then take Data Manipulation. They take uh, a one credit course, the Designing for User Engagement Seminar that Kelly talked about. They take Intermediate Microeconomics and Game Theory and Information Architecture. That is a really interesting semester. That, if you think about it, they're taking um, their Cognate and they're doing that in a really strategic way to cover Cognate and uh, stats requirement, which is part of HCI. Um, they're taking data manipulation, which really kind of dovetails into information analysis. Um, they're doing the engagement seminar, which is really, again, sort of looking, is a very broad based one credit seminar, uh, thinking about uh, the, the citizen interaction project uh, issues. Intermediate econ uh, microeconomics and game theory are really you know, officially in the information economics and management domain, but are a great extension of HCI skills. And information architecture is a course that as many library and information science students might take as, a as much as HCI. That field came from a blend of those two and it actually was largely or certainly significantly formed here, here at the school um, many years ago. Uh, that student continued their internship into the school year and actually became an officer in the IAR group, but they're an HCI student. <laughs> um, and then in their final term, the student took choice architecture, graphic design, information visualization, and they were a GSI in the communication studies department, then got selected for the global information engagement program, so are going to kind of, you know, finish up formally in August so the student can go to India. Um, so this student commented uh, about the plan that it was unplanned to apply and be accepted into the global information uh, program or the learning analytics fellowship, but it was a great way to work on projects that I am passionate about. Um, I knew I wanted to focus on HCI, but I never sat down to plan out the courses ahead. Instead, I decided to take the courses that appealed to me. When I finally looked at the, at the requirement sheet this semester, I was pleased to see a lot of my interests had lined up with the requirements. Phew! <laughs> um, and then he's saying that, um, you know, taking the uh, 588 course in the first semester was something that he was advised, and so it was sort of that blend of he sort of explored, and yet he was also following some key advice along the way. And just real quickly, another student who in their first year did a lot of our preservation of information coursework. So um, preservation administration, physical treatment processes, the, the records and archives course, and then also digital preservation and digitization for preservation, um, and then an advanced Spanish course for Cognate. Um, the student went and did an internship in Mexico, a digital preservation internship, and in the second year came back and completed really an array of courses that also align with library and information services, such as management of nonprofit libraries and information services, information resources and services, online search and databases. They took a course that didn't exist when they got here, so but during the course of their time, which was digital humanities. And basically this student said that during um, the internship, he was working at a desk on a computer in a cubicle. And so um, he says, although the work I performed was important and significant, I really missed interacting with patrons. This led me to add library and information science as a specialization in hopes that I would be able to work more with the public. And so the coursework in the second year reflected that. So as you can see, the interests evolved. The student, both of these students graduated on time. You know, they both did some things they didn't expect. They both took courses that were created after the point that they were sitting where you are, um, deciding to come to the school. Um, it's the kind of place where a lot of things happen and all you have to do is keep your head up, talk to people, and opportunities, you know, I can assure you, will come your way. So, if you do come to UMSI, you'll have access to faculty and staff advising to help you develop and evolve your academic plan to meet your intellectual and career goals. 
But wherever you go, um, I do encourage you to be asking yourself both the exploring types of questions and the planning types of questions as part of your strategy for making the most of your graduate education. Of course, I do hope that that does end up being here.